Welcome back to Face the Nation. We learned this week that President Trump has expressed interest in buying the world's largest island. He has been asking advisors about acquiring Greenland. CBS News correspondent Seth Doan is there and filed this report from Kulusuk. Walking through town here, you hear questions like, could it really be true? Could President Trump possibly be interested in having America buy Greenland? Tiny towns like Kulusuk are not used to getting this much attention. Greenland's allure is clear. Add to its sheer beauty, the natural resources, fish stocks, fresh water, minerals, and strategic location. It's a new frontier for adventure tourism, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs tweeted, adding, we are open for business, not for sale. And any talk of that seems a little bewildering to folks in Kulusuk, including the mayor. What did you hear? Uh, that Trump will, will buy the Greenland. That's what you heard? Yeah. What do you think? I think he's crazy. <laughs> That's a word we heard a few times. Oh, I think he's crazy. Why crazy? Because he's no the right person to buy a country like Greenland, which has the second biggest ice sheet in, in the world. Uh, if he buys it, he's going to melt the whole thing just to get the minerals, you know. At times, there's little distinction here between President Trump, the man, and America. Greenlanders have witnessed a growing race to control parts of the Arctic. China inquired about building airports. 900 miles from the North Pole. And since 1943, the United States has had an air base in northern Greenland. The U.S. has tried twice to buy Greenland in 1867 and then again after World War II. Both attempts failed. We took a helicopter to a remote glacier here to meet scientists studying the effects of a changing climate. I'm Seth Doan, nice to meet you. Seth, nice to meet you. Warm waters are melting glaciers, which could open new shipping lanes in the Arctic. Way out here, Denise and David Holland with NYU were surprised to hear what's being discussed. Have you heard this out here? No, no. we've been off the grid, so this is news <laughs> to us. <laughs> what would you make of that suggestion of the U.S. trying to buy Greenland? I think you should talk to Denmark. They could not be happy. <laughs> Greenland has been a Danish territory since 1953, and politicians in Denmark have rejected, even ridiculed, the idea of a sale to the U.S. This member of parliament said, I think it's a lack of respect to talk about Greenland as tradable goods. President Trump is expected to travel to Denmark in September, and a White House official tells CBS News the topic of Greenland is expected to come up, and staffers are already working on it. Folks here will most certainly be paying attention, too. We'll be right back with our political panel. It's now time for some analysis from our political panel. Dan Balls is the chief correspondent for The Washington Post. Nancy Youssef is a national security correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. Antoine Seawright is a democratic strategist and a contributor on our digital network, CBSN. And Leslie Sanchez is the CBS News political contributor and also a very familiar face on CBSN. Good to have you all here. Dan, does Senator Manchin have good reason to be optimistic about the background check legislation actually passing, or is it going to play out the same way it always has? Well, I mean, this is another opportunity because of the terrible shootings in, in El Paso and Dayton. Uh, and I think that there is a little bit more optimism that if President Trump gets behind this, something could be done. But I don't know that we know whether he's going to actually do that. I mean, that's the big question mark. If the president does begin to twist arms, as you were asking Senator Manchin about, then you might see some change. But absent that, I think we have to be skeptical. We've seen this time and time again where there seems to be a move and then things pull back. And uh, Leslie, it's not only a challenge to get some Democrats in the House on board with this version of legislation because they don't think it goes far enough, but for Senator Manchin, he also has to persuade the same reluctant Republicans to get on board with this. No, absolutely, and Dan's exactly right on this issue. The interesting thing aspect is Trump has an opportunity to provide some common sense legislation, common sense being the key word. Conservative populist movement is predicated on common sense, the idea that elites got it all wrong, they messed up the country, and that's what Trump basically ran on. 
he has an opportunity to look forward, especially that was something that would appeal to a lot of sensible gun right uh, gun owners, such as the red flag issue that Marco Senator Marco Rubio put forward, or universal background checks that Trump has kind of vacillated on. But those are real sensible things that could put pressure on Republicans while while bringing Democrats to the table. And, and, Antoine, where are Democrats on this? Because there's been criticism, as I said, that this Mansion Toomey bill doesn't go far enough. So a couple of things: no one has been impacted. Um, by this issue of guns, um, at probably this table more than me. I lost a friend, a mentor, and a business associate in Charleston, South Carolina, four years ago when nine people were killed in the church by a white supremacist who wanted to start a race war by the name of Dylan Ruth. Here we are four years ago, and legislation has passed out of the House by the Democrats in a bipartisan way that 90 percent of the American people support, like closing the Charleston loophole like universal background checks. And so the Senate does not have to reinvent the wheel. There's legislation sitting in the Senate that 90 percent of the American people support. That's Democrats, Republicans, independents, and independent thinkers alike. And so this idea that we have to start from scratch just blows my mind. The fact of the matter is I don't think uh, there are some Republicans uh, in certain districts who have an interest in doing anything on guns. Why? Because it is a popular political issue in a in a primary for Republicans. As it relates to Democrats, I think Democrats want to get something done. And for me, if we can do anything to prevent another mother from having to plan a funeral, or in El Paso's example, a child from having to plan a funeral, then I think we've done our job here as the American experiment. Nancy, I want to ask you about a big national security issue uh, facing this country. There are still about 14,000 American service people in Afghanistan, and we know the president has now been briefed on a potential deal with the Taliban. Talks are underway. What do we know about whether the troops are staying or going and when they might be coming home? So we know that the Taliban has said that one of the key issues that they want resolved is that the U.S leave completely, and the U.S. is saying they will only leave on a condition-based um, plan. And so what's happening now is Zalmi Khalizad, who is leading the talks for the United States, will go back to Doha and be in talks with the Taliban. One of the challenges that both the president and the Taliban have said that they want the U.S. to leave, and so many argue that the Taliban has the upper hand in these negotiations, given that the U.S. has signaled how much it wants to get out of this war. But at the same time, there's nothing to indicate that the Taliban will um, honor some of the key components that the United States is critical, says is critical to a peace deal, like recognizing the Afghan government, like dealing with um, other extremist groups that, like the Islamic State. And we saw sort of the peril and the fragility of the security situation just today when 63 people were killed in a bombing in Kabul claimed by the Islamic State. And so while there's a lot of talk of a drawdown or a withdrawal plan and peace talks, the underlying political situation and security situation, the, the challenges that have been there still haven't been addressed. And without seeing the specifics of the plan, it's hard to know what precisely the future for Afghanistan looks like. And how much is domestic politics playing in, if at all? There has been speculation that the president wants to bring troops home before the 2020 race. Well, what's interesting is there's domestic politics in Afghanistan and in the United States because there are elections happening in September. And uh, Secretary of State Pompeo said he wanted this deal reached by September 1st. The president has been adamant about how he doesn't want to have troops there for a sustained period. He said even when he um, built up more troops there two years ago that this was not um, a plan that he would have gone with instinctually. And so I think domestic politics are a huge part of it because when the military says we need more time after 18 years, there's a lot of frustration, I think, among the American public. The idea that, that that this war needs more time, particularly when it's not clear what is being achieved um, long term to sort of make sure that Afghanistan is not a safe haven. I think for all sides, the status quo is not tenable, and I think you're seeing that play out in domestic politics. And, and Dan, you're seeing that in the messaging between Democratic candidates and the president. They actually aren't that different on this issue. Everyone's promising to bring the troops home, but no one can quite fill in the blanks of what Nancy just laid out. That's right. I mean, what Nancy talked about is exactly the, the issue. I mean, that the Democratic candidates and are reflecting their constituencies. Um, President Trump is reflecting national, you know, weariness about why we're still in Afghanistan. But the question is, what are the what are the right terms to bring the troops home? What kind of residual force, if any, should be left there to prevent 
chaos from erupting immediately. And the degree to which there is a genuine security threat to the United States if we fully withdraw. All of those are issues, but in, in the broad strokes, a lot of Democrats are where the president is in saying, we need to, we need to end this after 18 years. Leslie, I want to bring up here a Fox News poll that got a lot of attention this week, and it shows that if the 2020 presidential race was held today, people polled were asked who would they vote for, and in virtually every single candidate going through the Democratic lineup, uh, President Trump seemed to be on the losing end. Sure. Uh I made a lot of news because it's Fox News, and that tends to be the, exactly. the conser more of the conservative base watching that. But I, I still think it's a lot of political hyperbole. We're still too far out. Uh, but some of the interesting things that are coming out of this, and I know we're going to talk about the economy, is how confident Republicans, let's say Republicans, are feeling about the economy. And if you look at a Gallup poll, there was 50 percent of the people feel that they are somewhat concerned, if not moderately, or very concerned about a long-term catastrophic health care issue or their own retirement security. And a substantial portion of that are Republican voters. So there's an opening there that's offsetting what should be a really bolsterous support for the president in terms of the economy today. But they're still looking at these long-term financial issues and how that plays out and what, to, and kind of, I would say, they're kind of shopping. These are voters who are shopping for a better alternative, especially on the health care solution. If they hear that, it might be more of a swing voter that you're looking at, and that's what explains what potentially could be that, that drift. That same poll showed a surge here, though, for uh, Elizabeth Warren pulling into second place behind Joe Biden and pushing Bernie Sanders down a notch. How much credence do you give this particular poll? What do you think about what's happening out so there? So several things. I think we have to remember that polls are a snapshot of the time. And the devil is always in the details. When is being asked? Who's asking the question? And for communities of color, it's how the question is being asked. That's number one. And number two, for me, there's no education in the second kick of the mule, as they say where I'm <laughs> from. Because I worked for Hillary Clinton in 2008 and in 16, and we saw the polls say one thing, but the end result was another. But I think there's some consistent things in all the polls we've seen. One, Joe Biden has been able to take the heat and not miss a beat. He still remains lock solid among the most loyal voting bloc in the group, I believe, who will decide who our next nominee will be and have a large say-so and who's next president will be, and that's African-American voters. But also something is true. Elizabeth Warren seems to be taking up the space on the progressive lane on the political highway. And she's pulling that from Bernie Sanders. She's pulling that from a lot of different places. What this poll, what this poll and many other polls also show is Kamala Harris's ability to stay solid. She continues to stay in the mix and the way it's shaping out with her endorsements of Congressional Black Caucus members and her ground support, she still remains the candidate to watch from a long-term perspective. But there's a lot of ball left to be played, a lot of plays to be ran. <laughs> <laughs> well, well put. And we have a lot more politics to talk about. So we're going to take a quick break and come back to complete the conversation in just a moment. Stay with us. We're back now with our political panel. Uh, Nancy, I want to start with you. Uh, we had this extraordinary event this week with what was a mix of a uh, domestic political fight between the president and some of his sharpest critics and opponents here, two members of Congress, become a diplomatic incident uh, which the Israeli government says was justified by laws they have on their books and an upset about a call for boycott That's right. um, to protest uh, the treatment of Palestinians. For people at home, this just seemed like a lot of political back and forth. What does it actually boil down to? Well, you're right. I mean, this was a primarily political battle, not only for the United States, but Israel. And it was really a collision, arguably, of sort of partisan politics. And so I think there are a couple sort of takeaways from it. One is that we saw that, um, that the Israelis election is sort of shaped in part by the United States. Remember that they have an election coming up in September, and during uh, their last uh, election, Trump recognized um, Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. So I think there was some concern that by not um, recognizing Trump's concern about Congressman Tlaib and Congressman Omar's trip, that they could lose political capital ahead of a very key election. But I also think that really raised questions about how much bipartisan support um, support for Israel will hold because we started to see some divisions. Now, that doesn't mean that the relationship is anyway broken, but we did see sort of increased tensions over support for Israel. So how long that will carry out and how long that will be sustained through the election, we'll have, to, we'll have to see. And Antoine, 
President Trump continues to say that these two freshman congresswomen are the face of the Democratic Party. They get a ton of attention and seem to like some of it. But is this a useful tool for the president or does it backfire? Well, just because he says it doesn't make it true. Uh, and it's useful for him because, as we've seen, he's on political life support when it comes to his popularity. And so for them, for him, this is a way to unite his base and, his base and bring, to get, bring together the forces that essentially brought him across the finish line um, last election cycle. But for Democrats, I think this is a rallying cry because even if you do not agree with the Democratic platform, even if you do not agree with everything Democrats have to say and what they advocate for, you realize what Donald Trump is trying to do, and that's divide the country. And I think what people have seen over the past several years is that we cannot afford to be divided on issues like race and some of the rhetoric we've seen come from this White House. So I say to the president, take your best shot. I think this will backfire not only for him and his reelection, but also some down ballot races that will be on the ballot next year. I, I think in many cases, uh, I completely disagree with the political life support. I mean, having come out of the field, it's astonishing how strong the support is for the president. They like what he's doing. And, and basically, they will tolerate the turbulence for the end result, meaning they like the stronger economy. They like the, the focus on immigration, particularly border enforcement. They feel both Republicans and Democrats have not been able to get anything done on that in two decades. They like um, some of the things he's doing with judges, deregulation, and he goes on and on. And more importantly, especially on the on the international front, the strong put America first as as out as, as you know from a simplistic standpoint. They like the standing strong and what that means, and they feel it's putting pressure on Republicans to take action on some things they didn't want to do before, and China's a perfect example. Dan, you had a, a sharp piece this week where you wrote, the president has little understanding of what it means to govern. He would rather tweet from the bleachers. <laughs> what were you thinking of when you wrote that? Good, well, <laughs> watching everything that happened over the past week, um, the huge decline in the stock market, which is a broader indication of the, the nervousness about mm -hmm. the economy, the questions about the trade war, um, what happened in Israel, um, all of these things. And yet the president of the United States was tweeting all kinds of things which seemed not to be particularly helpful other than to kind of self-aggrandizement. Um, and it just struck me that as we have watched him over now almost three years in office, um, that the complexities of governing are things that he doesn't want to pay that close attention to, that he's much happier being a commentator, if you will. Um, I mean, he did a tweet saying that uh, President Xi of China should sit down with the protesters and then everything would come out fine. It's not really how China works. Not exactly how China works. So it's, it's this question of, why does he feel the need to do that, and what does it say about him? Now, I don't underestimate his political skills or his resilience or the degree to which his base remains very, very solid. Um, but he will need more than the base that elected him in order to win this election. He's doing a couple of things. He is trying to run another campaign in which he will divide the country. He is doing everything he can to paint the Democrats as way far to the left and to knock down whoever becomes the nominee uh, with a very broad brush. Um, but in terms of his governing, I mean, there are big problems that he's got on, on, the, you know, on his plate, um, and he doesn't seem to be addressing those in a constructive way right now. Here's what Republicans seem to forget. The fact of the matter is the president, unlike 16, now has a record that he has to stand for or stand on. What most people will agree with, he has failed the American people in policy. And as a result, Democrats were able to beat Republicans like a drum in the midterm election in places where he was successful in 2016, like in the Rust Belt. The reality is they failed. The Republicans, led by Trump, have failed on the major issues. I'm not disagreeing that the economy is not important, but what's on the hearts and minds of people consistently has been health care. And that's where the Republicans have failed. They have not had a plan. And as a result, I think this is where the Democrats will have a leg up. And when you think about the economy, this economy has worked for some, but it has failed for others, particularly working class Americans that the president attracted 
expected in 2016. And I think that is our opportunity if we do our work. And Leslie, I want to get you on that because you had the president's trade advisor here saying there's nothing wrong with the economy. Everything's going well and everyone's misinterpreting this, including people in the market. Well, worry always gives a, a small thing a big shadow. So you don't really want to put a lot of worries <laughs> when you're talking about the economy. But I think to the earlier point I made, it's not just the economy that has to be strong. It's people's confidence in their own personal financial security. And those two are at a cross, uh, cross points and cross pressures right now. The thing with Trump that we have to remember is his high and low. People think about favorability like traditional historically we look at a reelection favorability. You can't look at that with this president because it's been flat. It hasn't had highs or lows. He's pretty much Donald Trump, and you you take it the way it is. I mean, and, and, and you hold your nose. And a lot of Republicans reminded me in the last couple of weeks that they did not vote for Donald Trump. They voted against Hillary Clinton. And when they look at the alternatives and the people that, that Antoine is talking about that won in 2018, those were centrist Democrats running on health care, a lot of pro-military, a lot of former service people uh, that, that stood very strong in competitive areas. You don't see that in terms of who's running for the national ticket today. So that's going to line up. In terms of telegraphing concern. President Trump almost every single day this week sent at least one tweet about China. Nancy, what is happening in terms of the <laughs> trade negotiations and th what we're seeing play out in Hong Kong? So in Hong Kong, it's, it was a fascinating week because it was quite dramatic. We saw an increase of violence by the protesters, by the police. We saw increasing tension by China, most notably by moving troops onto the border. And by the end of the week, we saw an effort at de-escalation by those on the street to move it towards more peaceful. We saw the Hong Kong police say, we don't need help from China. And so there was an effort to sort of reset on the street. Politically, we haven't seen it, though. The chief executive, Carrie Lam, had a press conference in which she wouldn't say whether she had autonomy over whether to withdraw the extradition law that really sparked this 11 weeks ago. And so what we're seeing is um, an effort to calm things down on the street, but there's no political solution that will that is the only way to end this. And so you're seeing somewhat of a reset, but there's no path towards a long-term solution. And so today, protesters came back out, and I think what they were really signaling is we're still here. Mm -hmm. the, the public outages, we haven't given up despite the very rough week we had. We're prepared to reset. We're prepared to keep going in the, f in the absence of a, s a political plan. And Dan, you know, you hear the president take a very hard line on trade with China, but he's been pretty restrained on human rights issues and mm -hmm. Hong Kong. How do you balance those things? Well, that's been a consistent part of his, his national security and foreign policy is, is he's been soft on the issue of human rights all along. I mean, there is a belief that he is going soft on that because he doesn't want to upset the Chinese leadership mm -hmm. in order to get a trade deal. But that trade deal continues to be elusive. All right. Thanks to all of you. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you all for watching. Until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.